There are many social and academic revolutions that we know that are going on in, in our land. Some are good, some are bad. Many long-standing trends and traditions are being challenged. Again, some are good and some are bad. It's happening in all phases of our lives, these changes and trends and revolutions uh, in social things, in medical, scientific, and even religion. But evolution in our thought patterns can be beneficial. Naturally, I'm interested in the religious evolution that is rather starting to sweep our land, I would put it. Much of it because of, I think, private home Bible studies that uh, are taking place and being prompted and encouraged by many churches in our land. People are beginning to discover that all that they have been taught may not have originated from the scriptures. And that can come as a complete shock. It's kind of like uh, denying apple pie and the American flag and Christianity all in one fell swoop. Many fundamental basic teachings are now being scrutinized. Uh, eternal torment, reincarnation, transubstantiation, afterlife in outer space uh, or going to heaven, and, uh, and m much more beyond that. And such studies and examinations are very healthy. A radical thinker, Tony Campolo, expresses, uh, shall we say, Church of God views on today's bulletin, which I shared with you. A scholar wrote in 1982 in a 500-page book about the subject of what is hell. It's written by, uh, it's called The Fire That Consumes. And he did a better job than any Church of God person's ever done discussing this subject. And he uh, leaves no stone unturned in that book if you want to plow through it. But um, he said this, What we have found beyond any question is that the Old and New Testaments alike, in a multiplicity of ways, terms, figures, pictures, expressions, and examples declare time and time again that the wicked will finally pass away and be no more. That is, they do not continue to consciously exist in a burning hell. That righteousness will then fill the universe and that God will then forever be all in all. Not one time in all of scripture does God say that any human being will be made immortal for the purpose of suffering conscious everlasting torment, unquote. Now what we're talking about here is innate or inherently immortal souls. And whether they go to heaven or whether they go to hell, we're still talking about immortal souls, which is our subject today and which is not taught in the sacred word. Natural immortality, no. Conditional immortality, yes. A very popular author, uh, professor, lecturer, and Christian, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Tony Campolo, has written wherein he very bluntly states the idea that a disembodied soul floats around heaven throughout all eternity is not a biblical idea. If anything, the Bible teaches that those who live after death do so in bodily form. Unquote. Now these rather uh, two recent and modern students of the word, which I have just quoted to you, uh, just a small, it's just a small sample of a very large body of people nationwide and non-Church of God people who are giving very serious second thoughts to a lot of church teachings that just doesn't seem to square with the Bible once the person begins to study it, study it seriously, accepting it at face value, and comparing scripture with scripture. Anthony Buzzard is receiving letters from all over the world where his book is traveled, saying, this is what I've always felt and thought, and, and uh, just rejoice to know that there's a group of people who believe like this. And so we're finding this uh, more and more. Solomon in the Old Testament, in his book of Ecclesiastes, puts heavy emphasis on the negative because he found that life on the whole is a negative. It took him a lifetime to discover that, but when all was said and done, he concluded, all is vanity. He was searching for truth and found that life without God is vain. That was one of the truths he found. He discovered many others too. But at some point, you might say he became cynical in his writings and in his comparisons. He finally reaches the point where he compares man to the common beasts. And in it he says, I said in my heart with regard to the sons of men that God is testing them to show them that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, 
and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity, all go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Found in Ecclesiastes 3. And even though Solomon is uh, accenting the negative almost exclusively in his book, there are contained in his book nuggets of truth, and we just read one, which is on a collision course with the general teachings that we hear so often today. Solomon tells us that in a critical area of our lives, we are no different than the common animal. It dies, and so do we. It breathes its last breath, it is put in the ground, and returns to the dust. And he says, and so do we. There is not the slightest hint in all of the book of Ecclesiastes or elsewhere in the Bible about an immortal soul that will live on after death. Indeed, Solomon becomes even more specific a few chapters later, and he writes, For the living know that they will die, but the dead, he says, know nothing, and they have no more reward, but the memory of them is lost. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and they have no more forever any share in all that is done under the sun. Found in Ecclesiastes 9. So Solomon really puts it quite bluntly, doesn't he? The dead know nothing, nothing. And that is not very much, is it? If we lived on after death, we ought to know something. But Solomon says that at death, the dead know nothing. We discover that he confirms the truth that is all through the scriptures, that the dead sleep in their graves until the resurrection. It's interesting, however, that in this same little book is a phrase that many who believe in the immortal soul use to prove their cause. And it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And if you would like to go there with me, you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and look at this little phrase. And this, in the book where it teaches so plainly that the dead are like the animals that die and, go, and are placed in the grave, yet they use this one passage quite often to show that this is not the case. After describing the frustrations here, uh, Solomon, uh, the complications, the infirmities and the agonies of old age, which we all will or have experienced or are experiencing, from verses 2 through 6 in chapter 12, then he finally gets down to verse 7. And in verse 7 of chapter 12, he says this, And the dust returns to the earth as it was. That means that the, the body goes back to the dust or the grave, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And uh, here's where the average Bible student who listens to the common teaching gets tripped up. If you listen to them talk, they use interchangeably the word soul and the word spirit. I think all of you have made, had conversation with those people, and this is what they do. They will say spirit for one, one minute, next thing they're saying soul, and they use it interchangeably. But this cannot be done because they are two separate, distinct words, each meaning something entirely different from the other. The text says nothing here about a soul, but only about the word spirit. And the Greek word from which this is translated is ruach, which means breath or wind. It's exactly the same meaning which is used in Genesis chapter 2, 7, when God declared, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Hebrew word for breath means puff or inflate or blow or wind. And when the breath entered the physical body, it then became a living soul. Conversely, Solomon is telling us when the spirit or the breath leaves the body, it becomes what it was before, which was a dead soul. So when God scooped up man and formed him and laid him on the ground, he was a dead soul. He was a dead being. When he breathed into him, he became a living being, a living soul. When the breath leaves, he becomes a dead soul or a dead being again. The spirit or the breath, then, is what returns to God in the sense that God gave us breath at death, oxygen to breathe, the air we breathe. This air or goes back into the atmosphere, goes back to God in that sense. God gave us a breath. He is taking it back. That is the punishment for our sins. So don't confuse spirit and soul. Each refer to two different things. Let's discuss immortal soul, which is not a biblical phrase or term, just for a few minutes. Remember, this is entirely different from the word spirit. 
Few beliefs are more widely held than this one of immortal soul. All of your Christian friends who are non-Church of God people probably believe in the immortal soul. Virtually everyone is familiar with the concept. The average religious person, if asked, would state it something like this. A human person is a body and a soul. The body is a physical flesh and blood shell temporarily housing the soul. The soul is the non-material aspect make, uh, made of spirit. And at death, they say, the soul leaves the body and lives on consciously forever in heaven or in hell. Now, some form of this understanding is found virtually among all peoples and all religions of the world today. Not long before I, I came to uh, Bedford, I attended a funeral for a young girl, a young lady who uh, was killed in an automobile accident. Uh, during the funeral, the minister made the following statements, and usually when I attend a funeral of another person not with our church and I'm not involved in the service, I sit further back and I take notes. And so uh, this is what he said. This is what I wrote down. He said, death is a graduation to a higher life. He said, death is designed to colonize heaven. He said, death does not mean we cease to exist, but we go to a different reality. He said, death is like a boat going over the horizon from our sight and into the vision of someone else's. Death is like that. We leave this shore and arrive at another. Our loved one is more alive today than she has ever been in the living presence of the living God. Now these statements uh, may sound nice, perhaps provide some kind of comfort to the people, but frankly I feel they do serious injustice to the truths of the Word of God, and I feel that if we know the truth, we need to be uh, honest to the truth of the, of the Word. The idea of an immortal soul uh, does not come from the Scriptures, but from human traditions and ideas. The ancient Greek historian Herodias of the 5th century before Christ tells us in his history that the ancient Egyptians were the first to teach that the soul of man is separable from the body and immortal. This Egyptian idea was centuries before Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam uh, ever came on the scene. The Egyptians had an elaborate concept of two souls, which they called the Ka, was a, spelled K-A, and the Ba, spelled B-A. The Ka was said to contain the vital force of life, while the Ba was that part of man that enjoyed an eternal existence in heaven. Now, we're, remember we're talking 5th century B.C., long before the New Testament was even thought about. The famous Book of the Dead, a collection of ancient Egyptian beliefs and ritual texts, lays out in great detail the many Egyptian beliefs that, uh, of the afterlife. And in one version of the work, dating from the 15th century BC, the Ba of a deceased person is pictured by asking one of the Egyptian gods, quote, How long have I to live? To which the god replied, Thou shalt exist for millions of millions of years, a period of millions of years, unquote. And so we ask what better description could we have for immortality of the soul? The soul's immortality did, did not stop with that ancient civilization. Notice again the testimony of the historian Herodias. I quote, he said, The Egyptians were the first that asserted that the soul of man is immortal. This opinion, some among the Greeks, have at different periods of time adopted as their own, unquote. And thus the pagan Greeks got the concept of the immortal soul from the Egyptians. The foremost advocate among the ancient Greeks of the idea of an immortal soul was the Athenian philosopher Plato, lived 428 to 348 BC, the pupil of Socrates. To make a long story short, uh, Plato popularized the immortal soul concept throughout the Greek world. In the Phaedo, one of Plato's most famous works, Plato recounts Socrates' final conversation with his friends on the last day of Socrates' life. And Socrates declared to them, and I quote, Be of good cheer, and do not lament my passing. When you lay me down in my grave, say that you are burying my body only, and not my soul. Unquote. 
So Socrates' statement is little different from the teaching that we find in many churches today. It will come as a surprise to many to discover that the idea of the immortality of the soul was not derived by the Jews in the Old Testament scriptures, but rather from Plato, who at least verbalized it and put it into workable form and uh, popularized it. Without going into a lot of dusty history, many theologians and scholars uh, of the professing Christian religion, including such men as Origen, Tertullian, Augustine, were closely associated with Plato's works. To cite one example, Tertullian, who lived after Christ, uh, 155 to 220, also wrote these words. For some things are known even by nature. The immortality of the soul, for instance, is held by many. I may use, therefore, the opinion of Plato when he declares every soul is immortal." Unquote. Remember earlier that we considered in Genesis 2-7, it said, man formed of the dust of the ground, it says, not of the spirit, became a living soul. A soul is what man is, it is not something that he has, it's what he is. The Hebrew word translated soul in Genesis 2-7 is widely used in the Bible. The Hebrew is nephesh. Nephesh designates temporary physical life. It means a living, breathing creature. And this is the same word used frequently in the first chapter of Genesis and elsewhere in reference to animals. Nephesh clearly has nothing whatsoever to do with any part of spirit essence. The soul is not a separate existence from the body that floats away at death. The soul is the body. Man is a nephesh. He is a soul. The Old Testament, such as we read in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, declares that the soul can die. Ezekiel says, for example, in chapter 18, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. If a soul were immortal, how could it die? It's a direct contradiction in terms. Then we ask, well, what about the New Testament? Maybe we can find biblical proof for immortal soul there. Well, I don't think so. In the New Testament, soul is a translation of the Greek word suke. It's the equivalent to the Hebrew nephesh. The word suke has no connection whatsoever of spirit essence or immortal soul. Jesus, in fact, declared that God is able to destroy one's soul. If you'd like to go to the New Testament with me, we'll turn to Matthew and look at chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, and see uh, Jesus is speaking there. Matthew chapter 10 at verse 26. 10, 26. Jesus says, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, utter in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim upon the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Or the grave, he means. Jesus tells his disciples, do not fear those who may murder you, is what he's telling him here, because they were being persecuted. He said they can kill the body, but not the body, soul, or life, or the life force forever. Rather, he says, fear God who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. The word hell, of course, here means the lake of fire. Obviously, the soul, what I, the point I want to make is the soul can be destroyed. It can be destroyed forever. It is not immortal. And thus, Jesus is saying here, Fear not, for an instant, those who can kill the body, but are not able to destroy you utterly and finally, as God can. For the disciple, his life, it says, is hid with Christ in God. We read that in Colossians 3. And although men may kill the body, in the resurrection, the life will be given back to the body. Paul says in the next verse in Colossians 3 verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So man can kill the body, not the life force of mankind. God can kill both and you will remain dead forever. Here's another simple illustration of what is being said on the subject. In Psalm 16, a prophecy is given that Jesus' body, or his soul, would not remain in the grave and decay. It reads, For thou wilt not leave my soul, my nephesh, in hell, or in the grave. And then when Peter quotes this passage on the day of Pentecost, 
He uses the Greek equivalent suke, and he says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul or my body in hell, that is the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption or decay. Paul quotes, or Peter quotes that in Acts 2. From this we learn that even Jesus' soul went to hell, that is to the grave, and if it had been left there, it would have decayed, gone back to the dust like we read elsewhere in the Bible. The soul, the body, that which, is, uh, which lives when breath still goes in and out of the lungs, can die. It is not immortal. I know this might sound a little confusing, and if you're not used to making these particular distinctions between soul and spirit, but they are definitely two different words and should not be used interchangeably as we hear so often. Spirit is our breath, the oxygen we breathe, which gives us life, Soul is our body that is sustained by the life-giving spirit, our breath, the air which we breathe. To make this clearer, I'd like to look at a few verses that use a spirit or ruach and almost defines the word uh, like a dictionary would. If you'd like to go back with me to uh, the book of Job, chapter 34, Job chapter 34 at verse 14, Job 34, 14. He's, uh, Job is speaking to God or addressing God, and he says in Job 34, 14, If he, speaking of God, should take back his spirit, that is breath, ruach, the same thing that we read in Genesis 2, 7, if you should take back your breath, your, the air, to himself, that if God should withdraw the oxygen from the earth and gather to himself his breath, what would happen? It says, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. How much clearer can that be? It's just like a def dictionary definition of what breath and spirit in the flesh is. If God should withdraw his spirit, that is the ruach, that is the oxygen of the earth, all flesh, the souls of the earth would perish. This clearly explains Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes, for the spirit is the breath, that returns to God in the sense that he takes back the breath that he gave us at the beginning. While we're in Job, let's go to uh, chapter 32, back a page or so. Chapter 32 of Job, verse 8. He says again, But it is the spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. The spirit, the breath. Here again, Job defines spirit. It is the spirit in a man, the breath, the life force, the oxygen, shall we say, the breath that we breathe, the breath of the Almighty, the air that he gives us. We're talking about oxygen, that which we breathe in and out every day of our lives, which sustains and gives life to the soul, gives life to it, and when it's gone, goes back to God, the breath leaves the body, of course, and we have a dead soul. Let's go to uh, Psalms. Psalms chapter 146, Psalms 146, and at verse 4, or 3 and 4, Psalms 146, 3 and 4, it says there, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no help, when his breath, that's ruach, when, when his breath departs, what happens? What happens to man when his breath leaves his body? He returns to his earth. On that very day, his plans or his thoughts perish. An echo of Ecclesiastes. The word breath is the same Hebrew word found in Genesis 12, or Ecclesiastes 12, Genesis 2, and so forth, in which there it is translated spirit. The text is, uh, is the one, as I said earlier, with so many used to prove that man goes to be with God at death. But that's not what that text says. It says his breath returns back to the atmosphere in the sense that God gave us breath. That's how we go back to God. But as this Psalm 146 text uh, and many others like it prove, ruach does mean breath. It does mean wind, a life force given to us by God via the oxygen, the air we breathe. And when this ruach, this breath, wind, and spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and on that day his plans perish. Uh, I hope this hasn't been confusing. It's, I didn't want to get into a whole lot of detail. But uh, we looked at Solomon's vanity and what he called life being vain. 
And that's because we are basically no different, he says, than a common animal, a brute beast. We both die, we both breathe our last. In fact, Solomon put it very bluntly, he, man has no advantage over the beast, the dead know nothing. We pondered the difficulty of Ecclesiastes 12:7. And that passage hopefully explained that the, when the spirit returns to God, it doesn't mean a soul goes back to God. Spirit is the breath. Soul is the body. Soul and spirit are two different words with different meanings. We took a few minutes to look at the Egyptian history and how the Greeks enhanced it into a, a rather sacred philosophy that has become doctrines of God, with Jesus, uh, which Jesus once charged as uh, traditions of men. We saw that Jesus' soul could have decayed pointing out beyond a shadow of a doubt that the biblical word soul does mean the chemical elements of the physical body, not something that floats away at death to be with God. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, said the prophet Ezekiel under God's inspiration. We learned that God can kill both body and soul, meaning he can destroy us finally and utterly. Man can only kill us until the resurrection. You may rightfully ask, why dwell on a word study like this for a Sunday morning message. Well, the Supreme Creator selected each word, I believe, and I believe in verbal inspiration, uh, at, at least in the, in the original giving of it. And uh, he has challenged us, he has challenged geniuses over the millenniums with his word. The words of the Bible have never been proven in error. Think of the millions of people, from geniuses on down to the common man, who have read, who have studied it, and it has proven itself true century after century. We've had so many people who were agnostics and atheists who were set out to disprove the Bible and were converted in the process, which brings honor and glory to God. Truth is the heart of the Bible. And if a relatively simple word study can help us to see that man-made deceptions have confused and bewildered the masses uh, since the days of Christ, then we ought to find truth any way we know how, even if it is in a simple word study, and to encourage us in truth. As regards our subject today, the simple truth is that man, soul, dies and sleeps in the grave until the awakening at the resurrection. His spirit or his breath departs from that soul or that body and returns to God in the sense that he gave us breath at the moment of our birth. God gives us breath and this breath returns to God's atmosphere at death when we breathe our last. To believe otherwise, I think, is to believe Satan's lie in the Garden of Eden when he lied to Eve and he said to her, you shall not surely die. But indeed, we do. Let's close by reading the words of a man who knew the difference and where the soul and the body rested after death. And that's in the New Testament in that great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. One of the most beautiful passages, at least to me, one of my favorite passages, beginning at verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. He says, Behold, or lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Isn't that wonderful? That's to know that we're not all going to be dead. When Christ comes, there's still going to be Christians alive at His coming. So we're not all going to sleep. We're not all going to die. But... We shall all be changed. All Christians will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable. So we are perishable now. That's what he's saying. This mortal nature is mortal and it can die. So he says this mortal nature has to put on immortality. In my version, I'm mixing King James in my version. And this mortal nature must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So um, Paul becomes sarcastic here a little bit. He's chiding death. He's mocking death. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Because it's already been destroyed when Paul wrote this. Because Jesus has already been raised to immortality. He's already crushed the head of the serpent. He's already delivered a mortal blow to death. So he says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. He says that's based in our everyday life today. That's where it hurts. But it's not a permanent sting. It's not going to last 
because God has already had victory. He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then what about that? Knowing this great truth, what? And therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What a glorious passage that is. Mortal bodies, souls, shall awake from the sleep at the resurrection. That glorious event only happens to those who know and love and serve the Lord faithfully today. And the question, of course, is, are you among that number who do so? Are you in the Lord, steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord? Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day uh, of salvation. Before your spirit, before your breath leaves your body, that is your soul, and you are laid in the grave to wait the resurrection, it is now that we say yes or no to God. In the last two verses of Solomon's negative book of Ecclesiastes, he gives this rather positive conclusion and summary and also warning. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What is the whole duty of man? Fear God and keep his commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so how indeed we should be working for the night is coming, that time when there will be judgment on the earth. We need to be ready for that. If you have not accepted the Lord and professed your faith in him and preparing yourself for that great day of the awakening, though you may be sleeping, you will awaken if you are in the Lord. And you will know immortality, though you are mortal now. If you haven't accepted the Lord, step forward as we sing this closing hymn. And I would understand you are saying you would like to accept Christ, like to die symbolically to the old nature, to be buried in the waters of baptism and rise, to walk in newness of life, anticipating the glorious immortal body.